The Projection of the Astral Body by Sylvan Muldoon and Hereward Carrington Abridged, read by Vincent Bagnall The astral body may be defined as the double or the ethereal counterpart of the physical body which it resembles and with which it normally coincides. It is thought to be composed of some semi-fluid or subtle form of matter invisible to the physical eye. It has in the past been spoken of as the etheric body, the mental body, the spiritual body, the desire body, the radiant body, the resurrection body, the double, the luminous body, the subtle body, the fluidic body, the shining body, the phantom, and by various other names. In recent theosophical literature, distinctions have been made between these various bodies, but for our present purposes we may ignore these distinctions and speak of the astral body as some more subtle form, distinct from the organic structure known to Western science and studied by our physiologists. The broad general teaching is that every human being has an astral body just as he has a heart, a brain, and a liver. In fact, the astral body is more truly the real man than the physical body is, for the latter is merely a machine adapted to functioning upon the physical plane. But it must not be thought that the astral body is held to be the soul of man either. That is a mistake often made. It is said to be the vehicle of the soul, just as truly as the physical body is a vehicle and constitutes one of the essential connecting links between mind and matter. To the materialists, of course, who regard mind merely as a product of certain brain activities, such a theory would appear superfluous and nonsensical. But the present book is not addressed to materialists. It is addressed to those who believe in the reality of certain supernormal psychical phenomena, and in the theoretical possibility, at least, of the astral body. To all such students this book will, I am sure, prove a veritable mine of valuable and unique information. The astral body then coincides with the physical body during the hours of full waking consciousness, but in sleep the astral body withdraws to a greater or lesser degree, usually hovering just above it, neither conscious nor controlled. In trance, syncope, while fainting, when under the influence of an aesthetic, etc., the astral body similarly withdraws from the physical. In such cases of withdrawal constitute instances of automatic or involuntary projection. As opposed to such cases, we place those of conscious or voluntary projection in which the subtle wills to leave his physical body and actually does so. He is then fully alert and conscious in his astral body. He can look upon his own physical mechanism and travel about it at will, perhaps viewing scenes and visiting places he has never seen before. Subsequently, he can verify the truth of these experiences by visiting the scenes or places in question. While fully conscious in the astral body, he seems to be possessed of extraordinary supernormal powers. He can at will return to his physical body or may be drawn into it again automatically by reason of some shock, fright, or vivid emotion. The astral and the physical bodies are invariably connected by means of a sort of cord or cable along which vital currents pass. And should this cord be severed, death instantly results. The only difference between astral projection and death is that the cord is intact in the former case and severed in the latter. This cord, the silver cord spoken of in Ecclesiastes, is elastic and capable of great extension. It constitutes the essential link between the two bodies. I should like to draw the reader's attention particularly to the fact that no wild or preposterous claims are anywhere in this book as to what has been accomplished during astral trips, 
Mr. Muldoon does not claim to have visited any distant planets and returned to tell us in detail their modes of life. He does not claim to have explored any vast and beautiful spirit worlds. He does not pretend to have penetrated the past or the future, to have relived any of his past incarnations, to have read any Akashic records, to have traveled back along the stream of time and reviewed the history of mankind or the geologic eras of our earth. He asserts merely that he has been enabled to leave his physical body at will and travel about in the present, in his immediate vicinity, in some vehicle or other, while fully conscious. This is perfectly rational and is precisely what we should expect on the theory that these trips are actual experiences. Assuming that some such entity as an astral body exists and can at times be voluntarily detached from the physical body, everything else which is said falls naturally into place and is precisely what might be expected to happen under such circumstances. There is a natural physical body and there is a spiritual body. So states St. Paul in his first epistle to the Corinthians. Psychic research, too, has long ago established the belief that within every material being is a non-material double, a cryptic entity coinciding with minute exactitude with the physical mechanism in every center and cell. Records are numerous, coming from many trustworthy scientists, which substantiate the claim that this non-material being, the astral body, as it is commonly termed by them, is capable of separating from its physical counterpart and of existing entirely outside its material abode, intangible to the beings surrounding it. This enigmatic occurrence will be spoken of as an astral projection or astral exteriorization, both terms being synonymous. In occult writings, many have told of this strange phenomenon of astral projection, but with all the knowledge thus far accumulated, we may still consider ourselves merely in the kindergarten of the school of mystery. For exteriorization of the astral body is, in fact, the first step into that mysterious realm called death, which sooner or later all of us must enter. So, reader, if you are interested in this dark phenomenon, if you have stood o'er the casket and gazed upon the cold corpse, and in silent awe have wondered how that being, who only shortly before was animate, possessed of intelligence, moving, thinking, and talking, even as you, could now be but a lifeless clod, the same as you shudder to think you too will become, then you are interested in astral projection. For astral projection and death are not unlike. Realizing that the world is filled with skeptics who stand pat in their tracks, proclaiming themselves practical, who are not open to new possibilities, the prove-it folks who cannot see that the road leading to the real is befogged with mystery and merges into the horizon of mystery at both ends, I wish to state that if you are one of this type, Looking for proofs that can be measured and weighed through the medium of your limited mind and five senses, you will not find theme in this book. The materialist, of course, will reject the very idea of astral projection as nonsense. Reason is his idol, the light that guides his convictions. He revels under what he terms the divine torch of reason. There is only one trouble with this divine torch. It doesn't shed much light on the mysteries of life. Life itself is beyond comprehension by the mind of man, to say nothing of its appealing to reason. Just which of the materialist's five senses it is that gives him an understanding of life, of creation, or of thought and mental processes, he does not make known, yet he must accept them. Indeed, everything is accepted without extensive reasoning. We may examine everything, analyze till doomsday, yet there will always loom up the inexplicable. On the other hand, the astral body belonging to every person is an exact counterpart of the perfect physical body of the person. It is composed of fine ethereal matter and is usually encased in the physical body. 
In ordinary cases, the detachment of the astral body from its physical counterpart is accomplished only with great difficulty, but in the case of dreams, great mental stress and under certain conditions of occult development, the astral body may become detached and sent on long journeys, traveling at a rate of speed only less than that of light waves. On these journeys, it is always connected with the physical body by a long, filmy, connecting link. And if this link were to become broken, the person would die instantly. But this is an almost unheard of occurrence in the ordinary planes of action. The astral body exists a long time after the death of the physical body, but it disintegrates in time. It sometimes hovers around the resting place of the physical corpse and is mistaken for the spirit of the deceased person, although really it is merely a shell or finer outer coating of the soul. The astral body of a dying person is often projected to the presence of friends and loved ones a few moments before the physical death. The phenomenon arising from the strong desire of the dying person to see and be seen. The astral body frequently travels from its physical counterpart in psychosemantic phenomena and visits scenes far distant, there sensing what is occurring. It also leaves the body during what are known as psychomantic dreams or under the influence of anesthetics or in some of the deeper phases of hypnosis when it visits strange scenes and places and often holds mental conversation with other astral bodies or else with disembodied entities. The jumbled and distorted recollections of these dreams are occasioned by the brain not having received perfect impressions transmitted to it by reason of lack of training, development, etc., the result being like a blurred or distorted photographic plate. We call ourselves physically alive, but in reality, the material part of us is as dead as a doornail. It is the energy behind the physical mechanism that is the real live thing. It is the neuric energy which animates. And the astral body is the condenser of the nervous energy you are using right now. Why, you will say, then the astral body is in existence now. And it is. Many have been the authorities upon this subject of astral projection, and many are under the impression that the astral body is formed by a mental process, which is not the case. If it were the case, where would the victim who is bumped off instantly get his astral body? If such were the case, no one would be possessed of an astral body after death except the fellow who is lucky enough to have heard of the creative mental process. Yes, you are using your astral body even now. It is tuned down, we might say, to harmonize with the vibrations common to material substance. Now, there are factors which hold it down, and there are factors which tune it up. The powers which can be exerted to disharmonize the attunement are the powers which will cause the astral to move out of the physical. The astral body coincides with the physical throughout, both bodies being substance. It is obvious that both will be identical in shape, and the phantom is, in appearance, an exact duplicate of the physical body. Surviving what is termed death, the astral body is often seen by others present at death. The true likeness of the physical. After death, the phantom continues to hold this true form, but sooner or later changes to a much more finely composed spirit. The range of vibration to which our earthly existence is limited does not extend over all creation. Consequently, we are unaware of the vast realities all around us. When the astral phantom, whose eyes you are using even now in reading this, when the astral phantom becomes tuned up, which it can be, those eyes will be able to see other things besides the familiar surroundings, and the astral body will be able to get out of the physical. The fact that the eyes after projection are capable of seeing earthly and other astral beings, too, shows that the range of vibration has increased. This may appear paradoxical to one who is accustomed to the idea that the conscious mind is a part of the physical mechanism, 
In fact, the material body has no mind at all, but clings over the astral. To speak symbolically, which is the real ego through which the conscious mind really functions, it is erroneous to believe that the astral being has a super mentality. It has not. The conscious mind, as you know it, is the mind of the astral body. Your normal conscious mind, everything it contains, is the you, you the individual, now and throughout eternity, learning as it goes. There is, however, the subconscious, that vast, unfathomable superintelligence which is well-nigh omnipotent and inherent in all. Yet we do not conceive this as the individual, and we do the conscious. Most believers in the spirit are somehow under the impression that to awaken in the astral is to be enlightened by all the powers of the subconscious, which is not the case, for the subconscious sustains practically the same relation to the exteriorized phantom as it does to the interiorized, physically alive being. Suppose, for example, that your physical body were to drop off or die this very instant. You would be in the astral, still unchanged, not as a superintelligent being, but retaining your identical mentality as before. No more, no less. And this is one great point to remember. The physical is but non-intelligent material and is like a cloak to the astral phantom. It is logical to suppose that at birth, the astral body, the ego, was brought into being by the omnipotent intelligence which is was and always will be, while the conscious mind of this body was in the form of a blank, ready to receive impressions, learn and grow. It matters not at what stage of life we may die. Our total consciousness at the end of earthly existence is the total we possess after physical expiration. One evening, when I dozed off to sleep about 10.30 p.m. in the same natural manner as I always have done, and I slept for many hours. During the evening at length, I realized that I was slowly awakening, yet I could not seem to drift back into slumber, nor further arouse. In this bewildering stupor, I knew within me that I existed somewhere, somehow, in a powerless, silent, dark, and feelingless condition. Still I was conscious, a very unpleasant contemplation of being. I repeat again, I was aware that I existed, but where I could not seem to understand. My memory would not tell me. The stupefaction which one experiences when first arousing from the influence of an aesthetic is similar. I thought that I was awakening from natural sleep in a natural manner, yet I could not proceed. There was but one thought dominating my mind. Where was I? Where was I? Gradually, it seemed an eon of time, but in reality, it was but a short interval. I became more conscious of the fact that I was lying somewhere. These few half-clear thoughts brought relative thoughts. And shortly, I seemed to know that I was reclining upon a bed, but still bewildered as to my exact location. I tried to move to determine my whereabouts, only to find that I was powerless as if I adhered to that on which I rested. Adhered. That is the exact sensation. If conscious at the beginning of exteriorization, one feels fairly glued down, stuck fast in an immovable position. A peculiar fact about this phenomenon is that one can be conscious yet unable to move. This condition I have called astral catalepsy. Since there is no word yet coined to define it, suffice it to say here that astral catalepsy can be present either with or without the functioning of the senses, and yet with or without consciousness, for astral catalepsy is direct subconscious control. While it is my personal opinion that I naturally possess a hidden power to project the inner being from my body, I also credit the extraordinariness of this first conscious exteriorization to the fact that several remarkable mediums slept in rooms adjacent to the one which I occupied. 
It is a fact, as most students of the occult understand, that a line of force can be established between persons for the benefit of another person. I have purposely omitted many details in drawing a picture of this first projection, which will be fully covered as we go more deeply into the study, but a long story in itself could be told of astral plane life, earthly relativity, association of phantoms, etc., yet no disclosure capable of being consigned to pen and ink could ever do justice to it all, so I shall refrain from delving into this department now, my purpose being to give a more analytic presentation of the phenomenon of astral exteriorization and how it is produced. About the first hotshot that the skeptic, or even delvers into the supernormal, will give the conscious projector is that he, the projector, did not leave his physical body at all, and that what he supposed happened was but a dream, which was indelibly registered in his memory. There is only one answer to this ridiculous supposition. If a person does not know when he is conscious, then indeed he should be submitted to a sanity test. The doubter will say, Now, you could have been dreaming all this. In your dream you would not know you were not fully conscious. Well, this is reverse reasoning. In a dream, a man may not know that he is unconscious, but when he is conscious, he does know positively that he is not dreaming. Why? Simply because we have a distinct understanding of both present and past when conscious. So do not form the idea that conscious astral projection is but a dream reminiscence. Now, let us go on. From what has gone before, we now have a fair mental picture of an astral body projection, wherein consciousness participated from the very commencement to the very finish of the process. It is, however, not always that such is the case, this being the exceptional and not the commonly met with occurrence. Consciousness, in fact, may interpose at any time or at any place or in any position during the process. It may be interspersed with unconsciousness, or it may never enter into the act at all. As a rule, when consciousness does intervene, it makes its debut after the body has already separated and is walking about, totally unaware of the fact up to the time of awakening. Incidentally, this being the most common time and place for the intervention of consciousness, it is also the most desirable, for thus the preliminary and disagreeable stages, spoken of in the foregoing account, are eliminated from the subject's consciousness. The elementary stages, the subconsciously controlled catalepsy, zigzagging and floating, are not pleasant to experience consciously, although one soon becomes hardened to them. Nevertheless, these preliminary activities always do take place, providing, of course, that the exteriorization occurs with the physical entranced in a lying or horizontal position when the subject is unconscious. Morbidity, an incentive to projection. The supposition should not be made that astral projection occurs only during natural sleep. It may take place when the subject is in practically any state of unconsciousness. In times of sickness, especially that sort of sickness which is stayed or sedative, astral projection can and often does take place. It is a fact that the more weakened, languid, and enervated the physical becomes, the more easily the astral member detaches itself from it. For at such times, less material resistance is brought to bear against the inner workings which prompt the separation. Undoubtedly, at the time of death, many people are already erect in the astral body before the final breath of the physical body is taken, although they may not be conscious of the fact. It is my firm belief that physical debility is an incentive to most kinds of mediumship. For the less material coordination a person has, the less material will be the influences to overcome by the subconscious resources. This morbidity factor is also true of astral projection. In making this statement, I am aware that it is contrary to the ideas of many prominent authorities. 
popular opinion seems to have it that perfect material coordination or health is an essential requisite to the production of the phenomenon of astral projection. But I hope to discredit this belief by quoting experiences and pointing out specific reasons for believing that the contrary is true. If I do disagree with others as to what produces, assists, or influences projection of the astral body, I do so because of my own experience with the phase. Exteriorization may be induced by hypnotism and mesmerism. It is a significant fact that Andrew Jackson Davis, the seer of Poughkeepsie, and one of the world's greatest, had astral projection induced at an early age by a mesmerist, William Livingston. Davis's first out-of-the-body experience was that of moving through the air in a spiral direction. Instantaneous projection is not uncommon. Probably everyone has at some time in his life encountered a jolt that made him see stars, as the saying goes. The glow seen is an aura and is visible for an instant as the two bodies discoincide. And this same glow in greater expanse can be seen for a longer time when the projection is conscious, i.e. at the beginning of a prolonged separation. The astral phantom is so much our very self that we do not realize how bound up in it we are. We do not seem to comprehend that we are using it this very moment. It is our life, this astral body, and when it permanently severs from the physical body, that physical is of no account. I wish I could convince you, the listener, that this phantomous body is not a new entity which you will acquire in the future. It is the you of the present, your consciousness, your animation. Without the astral body, your physical anatomy would be but a crude mass of insensible material, lying inert in the power of gravity. This phantom becomes accustomed to the habits it has formed by being coincident with or merged into the physical and made to conform to the laws applying to the physical. When something unusual or unnatural occurs to upset the harmony of the physical, a shock, a jolt, a broken habit, an intense, unappeased desire, sickness, in fact, anything which would cause a lack of perfect material coordination, there is always a jar to the astral. The Astral Cable Nearly every student of spirit phenomena professes to know that the astral cord is an elastic-like structure connecting the astral body with the physical, and this seems to be the extent of knowledge so far given to the world concerning this schematic astral organism. Such ignorance is not difficult to account for. On the one hand is the psychic experimenter who, if not capable of projecting himself, can only form his conclusions from the statements of others. On the other hand, most persons who do project do not maintain consciousness clearly, if at all. Some become possessed of temporary awareness at a distance from the physical body, and still others are so absorbed in the wonders met with that the thought of investigating causes never enters into their minds at the time. It is estimated that about 15,000 persons now living see more or less on the astral plane, and that about 50 persons can go out into that plane at will. Many times, while consciously projected, I have succeeded in intimately examining and observing the peculiar action of the astral cable. It is a, a sort of sideshow mystery, participating in the main act called projection. And this vital structure is composed, so far as I am able to see, of the same material or essence as the astral body itself. Its erratic action always made a very profound impression upon me, and at times I was almost led to believe that it actually was intelligent. Where it comes from on the outgoing of the phantom, where it disappears when the phantom coincides, are two deep mysteries for me to fathom. Its elasticity is far beyond the imagination and is not comparable to any material object in its stretching qualities. 
the nearest one can come, when trying to form a conception of the astral cord, is to compare it to an elastic cable, yet such a comparison does anything but justice to this truly living organ. The astral cord always stretches from one body to the other, regardless of the space or distance between them. The Purpose of Sleep Separation and discoincidence have been used more or less as synonymous terms, although actually there's a difference in their meaning in relation to astral phenomena. The astral entity can be discoincided from the physical and yet not be separated from it, so that a clear space lies between the two. That is, the astral can be one inch out of coincidence and still the bodies would, in parts, occupy the same space, yet these parts would not coincide with each other. I suppose you'll say, if this were true, we should have known it before. However, I tell you that every time you sleep, your astral body moves slightly out of coincidence, perhaps only a fraction of an inch, perhaps more. At any rate, there is discoincidence during sleep. Although this discoincidence may be infinitesimal and has little to do with one's ability to project, even though projection is an extension of discoincidence, one can be normal, entirely immune to astral projection, yet his astral body always slightly discoincides during sleep. Hereward Carrington was on the right track when he wrote, Various theories have been advanced in the past to explain sleep, but no satisfactory theory has ever been fully accepted. Thus, we have so-called chemical theories, which endeavor to account for sleep by assuming that certain poisonous substances are formed in the body during waking hours and are eliminated during sleep. Others have suggested that sleep is due to peculiar conditions of the circulation of blood in the brain, and still others that the action of certain glands explains sleep, others that muscular relaxation accounts for it, others that the lack of external stimuli is sufficient to induce profound slumber. All of these theories have been shown insufficient to explain the facts. We shall never arrive at a satisfactory theory of sleep, doubtless until we admit the presence of a vital force and the existence of an individual human spirit which withdraws more or less completely from the body during the hours of sleep and derives spiritual invigoration and nourishment during its sojourn in the spiritual world. An astral projection in which I moved a physical object. The experience which I shall now relate occurred on the night of February 26th, 1928. For some time, I had been suffering from a serious stomach complaint. I slept alone on the lower floor of the house, my mother and small brother occupying a bedroom on the upper floor. Between 11.30 and 12 o'clock that night, I was suddenly overcome by unusually severe pains in my stomach. Unable to help myself, I called several times for my mother, but as she was sound asleep, she did not hear me. I continued to call in vain for several minutes. Then... I decided to get out of bed and crawl along the floor to the hall, which leads to the stairs, hoping that from that spot she could hear my voice. I managed to get out of bed and started for the door, but the pain grew so intense that I could not reach it and fell over in a faint. I soon recovered consciousness again, and by exerting all my willpower, managed to advance a few feet farther, but having been confined in my bed for almost a month, the exertion was too much for me and I fainted again. This time... I woke outside my body and found myself moving up the stairs under crypto-conscious control, that is, without direction or effort on my part. Here, if ever, the crypto-conscious will was in a determined mood, for I never before remember being so completely under its deliberate influence. Naturally, I wanted to look at my physical body, which is always the first thing one does, but my thought to that effect had no influence upon the controlling power this time. Advancing up the stairs, 
I went through the wall of my mother's room and saw her and my small brother lying upon the bed sound asleep. This impression was very distinct, but at this point a gap came in my consciousness. On again becoming conscious, I found myself standing near the foot of the bed. I cannot say exactly what my movements were during this gap in consciousness, but on awakening I saw both of them, my mother and brother, in confusion, the former standing on the floor near the bed and the latter almost off the bed. They were talking excitedly about the mattress having been lifted up and rolling them out of bed while they were sleeping. All this was very distinct. I was as conscious as ever I was in the flesh. Instantly I vanished from the room. I was drawn down to my physical body and pulled into it with a spiral motion, experiencing a conscious repercussion while coinciding. I immediately called out to my mother again, and she hurried down the stairs, very excited, so excited, in fact, that she forgot all about my being out of bed and lying on the floor and began to tell me how spirits had lifted up the mattress and rolled her out of bed. She said that they had lifted it not once but several times, and she confessed that she was terrified for a moment. If occurrences such as these can take place during the nocturnal hours, when the subject actually finds himself involved in them, I wonder how many similar occurrences take place which are attributed to the dead, but which should be credited to the projected astral body under the influence of the hyperpositive crypto-conscious will, while the subject is not conscious. No doubt many. Thought sustains the astral body. It is thought which sustains the astral body. Do you think that the astral phantom walks upon the floor of a house because the floor holds him up? No, never that. He is independent of the floor. He does not make contact with the floor at all. Yet he can walk upon it. Why? Merely because his thoughts sustain him. He has always walked upon floors in the physical and through force of habit thus learned in the physical. The habit rooted in the subconscious mind, he is sustained. The habit of walking upon a floor permits a phantom to do that in the astral. It holds him on the line of the floor, so the desire to walk upon an upper floor could sustain the phantom and allow him to do that. The subconscious will regulates the weight of the astral body, causing it to rise, to fall, or to remain at any given elevation. The conscious will can do the very same thing also. All this can be never be explained by mortal mind. How thought creates or makes reality in the astral world. Imagine walking upon the upper floor of a house, as if that floor sustained you, and yet not making contact with the floor. You would naturally suppose this would be a strange sensation, but it is not. In fact, it is unnoticed by the phantom. But if one begins to think about it as I have, Many times, down through the floor one goes. Why? Merely because the projector thinks that the floor, not making contact with him, cannot sustain him. One goes along unconsciously walking in this manner because the subconscious will, through habit, actually holds the body in its position. You do not think of walking in the physical, do you? Neither do you in the astral. It is habit. In other words, subconscious expression. Similarly, when you walk upstairs and downstairs in your astral body, you are not aware that you are not actually stepping upon the stairs. But think of it, and down you go. An Encounter with an Astral Fiend In 1923, a man living in my hometown died of cancer of the stomach. This man's wife was well acquainted with my mother, and a few days after the funeral chanced to be talking to her. She, the wife of the dead man, confided many things to my mother and told her the real character of her husband. F.D. He had been a brute, all bad, according to her story, and some of the things which were said concerning the dead man aroused within me a hatred of him. I remember very clearly standing back and 
taking in the conversation between this woman and my mother and how my blood boiled with rage against the dead man. This conversation took place at 7.30 p.m., and by 9 o'clock I had forgotten the incident, but that night, on going to sleep, I experienced a conscious projection. I had undergone the primary stages very perfectly, landing upon my feet just outside cord activity range. And I was free. I walked ahead a few steps, then stopped to look back at my physical body. One seldom fails to do this. My eyes encountered an ominous spectacle, a terrifying sight. There stood F.D. glaring at me like a maniac. I shall never forget the savage look upon his face as long as I live. I knew instinctively that he meant revenge and was frankly terrified. I did not know what to do, but before I had time to do anything, he leaped upon me. We fought for a few moments, he getting the better of me as he cursed and beat me with all his might. His strength seemed greatly superior to mine at the time, but in a moment I suddenly realized that my controlling power was pulling me in. When this power came to my rescue, F.D. seemed like a mere pygmy in strength, for I moved steadily toward my physical body, he clinging on to me as I did so. When I was inside cord activity range, even greater power seemed to overwhelm me. I was raised into the air horizontally, in spite of all the fiend's efforts to hold me, pulled to a position directly over my physical body, and dropped. A drop that caused probably the most severe repercussion I have ever experienced. As I became physically alive again, I was throughout as conscious as I am this very moment. Skeptics may say that this was a nightmare, but I know when I am conscious, and I know what is real when I am conscious. It was no nightmare. It was real. It was as real as any tussle with a flesh-and-blood devil could be. Was it Luther who claimed to have had a tussle with a devil? Who knows? Perhaps he did, although I never read them. I have been told that there are other accounts in spiritist literature not unlike this one. The Akashic Records There is a widespread belief that once a person is projected from his physical body into the plane of forces, or the astral plane, he is at once possessed of the faculty of seeing both past and future. In all my conscious projections, however, I have seen only the present, just as I see only the present, but remember the past as I write this account. It is claimed that somewhere in the plane of forces there is a record of everything which has ever been said or done, and that under certain conditions one can read this record, although I have never seen them, the Akashic records as they are called, and although I have never seen the future either while conscious, I have, while partially conscious in the astral body, lived through events which had not yet occurred in my physical life. I shall tell of this presently. First allow me to summarize what others have said of the Akashic Records. The Akashic Records are not contained within some great book, but are impressions of every word, scene, and action which has ever occurred in the universal ether or astral light. This should not be so great a marvel, however, for we have an example of it in our own memory. Stored away somewhere is the record of our past. Dissect the brain and you find no trace of what we call memory, yet every time you recall a past event, you have proof that somewhere this record lies hidden and invisible. Where, then, is the memory? Is the Akashic record so much more mysterious than your own memory? Astronomy teaches us that light travels at the rate of more than 186,000 miles a second. There are fixed stars so far distant from the Earth that light which left them thousands of years ago is only now reaching us. We can look at a distant fixed star, but we do not see it as it is or where it appears to be, but we see it as it was hundreds of years ago when these light rays left it. Enacting future events in the dream body. Frequently, the future contemplating mind will cause 
the projected dreamer to live through events which have not yet happened in the material world. So, of course, one can have a future contemplating dream in which the dream body does not act out the apparent action, but it frequently happens, especially to those inclined toward projection, that a future contemplating dream takes place in which the astral body does participate. And I've had many experiences such as this, awakening from a dream and finding myself acting it out in the astral body. The following is a simple example. I dreamed that I came out of my front door of my house and started to walk up the street on my way to school. To get to the schoolhouse, I could either go in one of two ways. One, a direct route leading through the residential district, and the other, leading through the business district. But on returning to school after my noonday meal, I almost invariably went through the residential district, the shorter and more direct route. In the dream, as I walked along the street, I heard someone calling me and turning around saw one of my friends who lived several blocks beyond my home running to catch up with me. He was in my class at school, and as we walked along, we discussed the problems of the afternoon session. Finally, we came to the place where the trail branched, one running through the business section, the other through the residential district. I started to walk along the latter route and expected my friend to go that way too, but he said, come on, let's go through the town. We've plenty of time. So we went by way of the path which led through the business section. I stopped to look into one of the store windows, and seeing a pair of socks, which struck my fancy, I entered and purchased them. Then we walked on toward the school building. As we advanced through the park, I saw a boy, whom I recognized at once, coming toward us. As we met, he came very close to me and spat upon one of my shoes, then with a gesture said, Tee-hee, and ran. This boy was a mischief in reality, too. It was several weeks after that this occurrence actually took place. Everything occurred in the same order as it had happened in the dream. I left home on my way to school. My friend hailed me. We walked to the fork in the trail where he persuaded me to go through the town. I saw the socks in the store window and purchased them. We went through the park and met the small boy, the same boy I had seen in the dream. And as he was approaching, I said to my friend, this kid's going to spit on my shoe. And he did, saying tee hee and running. From this you can see that the astral body acted out an event which did not occur in the physical world until several weeks later. Death is merely a permanent projection. Death is but a permanent projection, a projection of the astral body, wherein the subject does not return to animate his physical counterpart. Most deaths are, without a doubt, unconscious. Dr. Bailey has stated that all his observations of deathbeds inclined him to believe that nature intended that we should go out of the world as unconscious as we came into it. And he adds, in all my experience, I have not seen one instance in 50 to the contrary. There are exceptional cases in which the consciousness seems to be retained to the very last. Sir Benjamin Brody and others have recorded such cases. Professor Hysop had a valuable article on the consciousness of dying in the journal of the SPR in June 1898. He makes it a point that in view of this undoubted fact that the patient seems to be conscious of his own passing, and inasmuch as it would be impossible theoretically for consciousness ever to be conscious of its own extinction, the appearance in that consciousness is being merely withdrawn, not extinguished. One may consider himself lucky indeed if death takes place while he sleeps and is not brought about through violence. Violent death is a great shock to the consciousness and implants the stress of the shock in the subconscious mind, and in many cases the victim remains in a condition of semi-insanity in the Earth's atmosphere. So the stress of a violent death, which is put into the subconscious mind, not infrequently causes the victim to live over and over again his death in his astral body, obsessed himself and sometimes obsessing others. However, it is quite probable that permanent projection, or death, and temporary projection are very similar in nature, and that no two persons would have exactly the same experience in passing. Some would pass out of the body consciously, others would be in a partially conscious condition, while the majority undoubtedly would leave their bodies while quite unconscious. Some spirits who have returned seem to have had a more or less clear consciousness of passing. In this connection, allow me to quote a paragraph from a reported case in which a soldier, Private Dowding, describes his own death through the mediumship of Mr. Tudor Pole. 
As you see, I hasten over these important events important to me once, but now of no real consequence. How we overestimate the significance of things earthly. I was afraid of being killed and was sure it would mean extinction. There are many who still believe that. It is because extinction has not come to me that I want to speak to you. Physical death is nothing. There is really no cause for fear. Some of my pals grieved for me. When I went west, they thought I was dead for good. This is what happened. I had a perfectly clear memory of the whole incident. I was waiting at the corner of a traverse to go on guard. It was a fine evening. I had no special intermission of danger. Until I heard the whiz of a shell. Then followed an explosion somewhere behind me. I crouched down involuntarily, but was too late. Something struck hard, hard, hard against my neck. Shall I ever lose memory of that hardness? It is the only unpleasant incident that I can remember. I fell, and as I did so, without passing through any apparent interval of unconsciousness, I found myself outside myself. You see, I am telling my story simply. You will find it easier to understand. You will know what a small incident dying is. Think of it. One moment I was alive, in the earthly sense, looking over a trench parapet, unalarmed, normal, Five seconds later, I was standing outside my body, helping two of my pals carry my body down the trench labyrinth toward a dressing station. I seemed in a dream. I dreamt that someone or something had knocked me down. Now, I was dreaming that I was outside my body, and soon I thought, I shall wake up and find myself in the traverse, waiting to go on guard. Later, Private Doubting wrote, when I lived in the physical body, I never thought much about it. I knew very little about physiology. Now I am living under other conditions. I remain incurious as to that through which I express myself. By this I mean that I am still evidently in a body of some sort. But I can tell you very little about it. It has no interest for me. It is convenient. It does not tire. It seems similar in formation to my old body. There is a subtle difference, but I cannot attempt analysis. Each of us creates his own purgatorial conditions. If I had my time over again, how differently I should live my life. I neither lived enough among my fellow men, nor interested myself sufficiently in their affairs. We find many points in Private Dowling's tale which agree with what we have learned from temporary astral projection. At one extreme is the materialist, proclaiming that death means the complete extinction of the individual. At the other extreme is the spiritualist, maintaining that death is but the beginning of a greater life. And between these two schools of thought, there exists an army of cults, religions, and creeds, most of them regarding death as a curse which has been bestowed upon humanity. Surely it is not death which is the curse. It is life, life, with its pains, its turmoils, and its hardships, is the curse which has been bestowed upon mankind. No future state of happiness is worth suffering for. Nothing can compensate for the pains and torments of life. One must be a Stoic, indeed, to be able to live in joy on another plane, knowing at the same time that others are suffering on this plane. Such a person, in my estimation, does not deserve to be happy. Is it possible that spirits lose that divine trait? Sympathy? O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? It is indeed Stoic philosophy. There is a sting in death, the dying mother clutching her babe, the dying father leaving the wolf at the door of his half-raised family. The lover weeping o'er the cold corpse of his sweetheart. Oh, death, there is thy sting. O oh, grave, there is thy victory. For my part, I see life as the curse. I regret that life exists. No mortal mind can advance even the weakest argument in defense of life. I regret that the materialist is mistaken. I regret that death does not end all. I wish that death would bring one long and dreamless sleep. But, alas, 
my experiences have proved conclusively to me that dust thou art, and to dust returneth. The 20th century is too busy to occupy itself much with the problems presented by death and what follows it. The man of the world makes his will, ensures his life, and dismisses his own death with the scantiest forms of politeness. The churches, once chiefly interested in the ultimate fate of the soul after death, now devote the bulk of their energies to moral instruction and social amelioration. Death is all but dead as an overshadowing doom and an all-absorbing subject of controversy. To all those seeking the truth on this question, i.e. whether psychic phenomena are from the spirit of man or from the ingenuities of the devil, I wish to say that once you experience the projection of your astral body, you will no longer doubt that the individual can exist apart from his physical body. No longer will you be forced to accept theories. No longer will you be forced to base your belief in immortality upon the word of the medium, the pastor, or the holy books for you will have the proof for yourself, as sure and as self-evident as the fact that you are physically alive. For my part, had a book on immortality never been written? Had a lecture on survival never been uttered? Had I never witnessed a seance or visited a medium, in fact? Had no one else in the world ever suspected life after death? I should still believe implicitly that I am immortal for I have experienced the projection of the astral body.